Professor Martha Grogan is the director of the Cardiac Amyloidosis Clinic at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, she has a very long, it, deep experience in the management of the disease and was the first to describe what physicians use as the staging system, the way in which we gauge the prognosis and try to assess the outcome of this disease. And she'll be talking to us about some of the imaging we use to diagnose it, as well as some of the blood test markers that help us understand the severity. Dr. Grogan. Thanks, Maury, and thanks, Muriel, for having me. Uh, again, so exciting to see a lot of people from uh, previous meetings and a lot of new people. It's kind of like a reunion here. Maury mentioned we're gonna have a lot of time for questions, so remember the only dumb question is the one that you don't ask. And these meetings are so important to us because we learn so much from you. You are truly the experts in this disease. That's why almost our whole research team is here. Now, I was thinking of doing something really, really brave, and that would be to not do what Muriel told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> However, Steve Finkel took me aside last night and said, don't do it, don't do it, you know. But I, I did do one little thing. We're really not gonna talk about imaging because there's so much imaging to come with the others. So many of you know, I don't have to tell you that getting the diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis for many people is like getting struck by lightning. And that's why we're all here to give you the knowledge that you really need to know to battle uh, this disease. And we'll just briefly review the heart. Your heart has four chambers. The upper chambers are the collecting chambers, the atria, and the lower chambers are the ventricles. They're the ones that are pumping the blood around your body. And it's pretty amazing. Your heart is about the size of your fist in the left side of your chest. It actually pumps a total of 2,000 gallons of blood a day. So it's kind of amazing that more things don't go wrong with it. Two and a half billion uh, heartbeats in your lifetime. So you'll see the blue blood comes back to the heart. Uh, it's low in oxygen, and then it goes through the valve, so, and then gets pumped out to the lungs. So in your lungs, now the blood picks up oxygen, so it's red blood. So that's why your heart is divided into the chambers, and you see those valves that are just keeping your blood going in the right direction. Well, what happens um, when the heart gets amyloid in the heart? So amyloid fibrils get in between the muscle cells of the heart. So you have millions of cells in your heart that are all beating, contracting, shortening. That's what's making your heart pump. And with, we might have to click on that actually back there. Let's see. Oh, here we go. So um, your heart is beating. This stiff amyloid gunk gets in between those heart muscle cells. It doesn't get in the heart muscle cells, but in between. So now you'll see on the picture of the heart that the heart is getting much thicker, but not because you built up muscle, but because there is amyloid infiltrating there. And similar to what happens in the nerves and other parts of the body. And then when your heart gets thicker, it's stiffer and it's harder to fill. So pressure backs up and that's how you can get fluid in and around your lungs and eventually on the right side, fluid in your legs and your abdomen. So your heart should be very elastic. It should contract and then relax like a rubber band. It should be nice and stretchy or like a nice bulb syringe. You squeeze it and then you should be able to suck blood back into your heart. So in amyloid, most of the time, the main problem is not the pumping function of the heart, it's that the heart is too stiff. So that's just a quick review, and many of you know these signs and symptoms of heart failure. Dr. Moore is gonna tell us how to treat these symptoms, um, but many of you have had these. Sometimes there won't be fluid building up, they'll just be profound fatigue or exercise uh, intolerance. So, Let's look a little bit more about the heart. So this happens to be AL amyloidosis, but in TTR, a similar thing. You see those little molecules flying in there. The whole point is it's not just the amyloid infiltrating the heart. It's some of the direct toxicity of some of the subunits. And the real point about this is it's not as simple as sometimes we show it. And our colleague, Dr. Falk, calls amyloid heart disease an infiltrative toxic heart muscle or myocardial disease. And I just want you to know that it's not just thickening of the heart, it's more complex than that. And Dr. Ruberg and Dr. Wall are gonna tell you a lot about imaging of the heart. 
The key thing for you to know, there's not just one number that will tell you how your heart is doing. The heart um, has many different ways we look at it. If you look at your echo report, you'll have about 100 different numbers. So don't get too focused on just one particular number. So what are the blood tests that we can use to assess the heart? Um, Dr. Dispensieri is one of the gurus of what we call biomarkers, heart blood tests, because she's very mathematical. And she wants to bypass these cardiologists because maybe it's hard to get into us or whatever. So she helped us with AL, and now we've done similar things with TTR, where some very simple blood tests tell us a lot about the heart. We maybe don't need so many other things. So what is troponin? Troponin is a protein that's released from heart muscle, usually when it's damaged from a heart attack. But I showed you the amyloid fibrils in there right next to your heart muscle cells. So in amyloid patients, some of this troponin can be leaking out. But for most of the time, if you have cardiac amyloidosis, the troponin elevation does not mean that you're having a heart attack. One important thing though, sometimes doctors will get confused since troponin usually means heart attack and they might tell you that you had a heart attack when you really didn't have one. So the fact that you know that your troponin is elevated can be helpful. Second important thing is, let's look at the age of many of our um, participants here. You're not immune from a heart attack, so it doesn't mean that troponin would never ever go up and down. If it goes in the spike and dome, you know, then it might be a real heart attack. So. Uh, sometimes it will mean something. So troponin tells us how much damage has happened to the heart and it can be very helpful. BNP or NT proBNP, these are also proteins that are produced in the heart. And when the pressure in the heart goes up, when the heart isn't pumping well because it's stiff or because it's reduced in its uh, contractility, then this substance BNP or NT proBNP will be released. And it's really got a long name. So BNP was first found in the brain, even though most of it comes from the heart. It's brain naturetic peptide. I always like to know where do these long words come from? Well, naturetic just means gets rid of salt and water. What else gets rid of salt and water? Something a lot of you are taking, right? Diuretics. So Lasix, torosamide. So you can kind of think of it that the body is so well designed that if the heart isn't working well and it gets stretched out from this pressure, your body makes a substance that's kind of like a diuretic. But in the blood, we're gonna see more of this substance because that whole system is revved up. So it gives us an idea of, of how much pressure or how much heart failure you might be having. But it can vary quite a bit, about 40% in a week, even if the patient's stable. So we are looking for big trends, not just a single number with this BNP and is similar to um, troponin as well. Then prealbumin is transthyretin. So um, that is another way of um, kind of assessing the stability of the TTR. It's not a direct way, but kind of indirect. And important to know that if you're on a stabilizer, this prealbumin level will go up, but if you're on one of these silencer medications, it will go down. So you'll see that we sometimes follow this prealbumin. Right now, we don't adjust doses of medicines or anything, but you might see that test on your report. And right now, from what I just told you, you already know more about cardio, cardiac biomarkers than almost all of your doctors. So <laughs> um, what about the different, uh, and I'm not gonna show you strain because Dr. Ruberg might show you that. If not, we can do it in the workshop, but we could definitely teach you so you know more about the strain than most of your doctors too. And ejection fraction, as some of you know, one of my favorite topics, but you can watch that on the video. So what are these different troponins? Troponin, I told you, is a protein. One is troponin T. Then there's high sensitivity troponin T. That just means it can detect even smaller amounts. So cardiologists go all over the hospital when people have these little bit of troponin trying to figure out if it's a heart attack or not. In your case, we use it to assess your cardiac amyloidosis. So I just want you to see that there's different numbers here. You just need to know that these are different assays and these are the equivalent. There's not an exact formula to translate these, but depending on where you get your blood drawn, you might have a different type of troponin. So what are these staging systems that we're talking about? How do we use these simple biomarkers? Um, for the Mayo staging system, we use troponin, 
and NT propion P to try to figure out how long a patient is going to live or how high risk they are with their TTR amyloid. So these staging systems are done at the time of diagnosis. And remember that the staging system, both the Mayo system and the one from the UK, we lost our um, pictures, but anyway, those um, were for patients who were not on any treatment. So these are just um, patients with natural history before we had the medications, but it still gives us an idea of how high a risk are you. So the bottom line, we don't need pictures, you can get by without pictures, is that uh, we developed this simple staging system. So we look at NT, Pro, BMP, and we have a threshold, a cutoff, which turned out to be 3,000 picograms per ml. Then we had troponin, it was the old troponin, so it was 0.05. Now with the high sensitivity, it's 65. And then we divided patients who had wild type TTR in the case of our um, staging system. If both of the numbers were low, the patients lived the longest, you know, five or six years. This is people without any treatment. If one was high and the other one was low, they were in the middle. And if both of those were high, then the patients were much higher risk and they didn't survive nearly as long. But when you read these papers, this is not for most of you who are on treatment as far as how long you're going to live, but it still gives us an idea of how risky it might be. And the National Amyloidosis Center in the UK, they developed a very similar system with the same NT Pro BMP cutoff of 3000, but they use something called estimated GFR. That's glomerular filtration rate. That's an assessment of your kidney function. And the heart and kidney are inter, you know, quite intertwined. So they use that number instead. But it's a very similar thing where we can divide patients. So that really helps us. That helps us when we're doing clinical trials. That helps us when we're thinking, you know, does somebody maybe need a heart transplant? But I just want you to know that these are estimates for large groups of patients. It doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen to you. There always will be outliers. And I don't think anybody here is average, so you don't necessarily want to go based on the average. So that is a cardiac biomarker staging system. But patients always want to ask, you know, how, how am I really doing? Well, we have the biomarkers. We have prealbum, as I told you. But a lot of it is really how do you feel? How far can you walk? That's why we use six minute walk or other tests. How much diuretic do you need? How much of that water pill do you need? Have you been in the hospital for heart failure? Have you had that happen? Those are really the things that tell us. So you won't see this because the slide's not up, but in the end, probably the best biomarker is you. You are really the best marker of how you're doing. And I found a quote from Dr. Spock. Since I'm a grandma now, I kind of learn about Dr. Spock, mom's on call, all this stuff that they read. But one famous line from Dr. Spock is, trust yourself, you know more than you think you do. So you're the best biomarker, but that's the staging system. Thank you very much.